الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عسيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters Committed Muslims I understand that because of the weather In the first instance I'd like to thank all of those who showed up here on this very cold day and for that reason inshallah we'll try to keep it very short <coughs> though the subject that we are going to approach today demands more time and it demands more explanation but because of the nature of the circumstances we hope that what Ever is outlined here today in what might be considered considered broad strokes that we go home and give it some thought so that it is anchored as a commitment in our hearts and in our consciences of course for those who pay attention to these things we are in the midst of what is known as Unity Week. And this is a remembrance of the lifetime of the lifetime and the struggle and the commitment of Allah's Prophet Alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam. And it just so happens that this Unity Week this year occurs during an election season. 
And so it behooves us as a matter of taqwa on this Jumrah to talk about the leadership of Allah's Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam in whatever dimension is appropriate to that particular time and place in which we live. We happen to be on the tail end of the election season in this country. And so we might ask ourselves, why is it so important for us to mention or to talk about these elections using the Qur'an and the example of Allah's Prophet as a reference? Why is it so important for us to mention the elections in this country? For there are elections that are going on all over the world and these elections basically take place every year in some part of the world. But when we talk about the elections in this country, we are talking about one chief executive succeeding another chief executive in the dominant power culture of the world. And so whoever assumes the top leadership position in the dominant power culture, that person in a sense becomes the leader of the world. Whatever policies he chooses to follow, they become the policies that everybody else in the world is required to commit to. Whatever programs he initiates, everybody in the world is expected to participate. And so given that this is the context, There are Muslims in our world today and these are not only a few of them. They happen to be in substantial enough numbers that their positions carry enough weight to influence the way that their societies behave. And so there is a powerful contingent, an influential contingent amongst the Muslims that looks at what it considers to be a peaceful transition of power from one chief executive to another. And then it asks itself that in comparison to the majority Muslim world where there is anarchy, and oppression and tyranny that why is it that Allah and his prophet did not leave for us a divinely and a prophetically approved mechanism so that we can have a peaceful transition of one leader to another and some members of this contingent go so far as to suggest that there is something deficient in Islam, that there is something missing in its political structure. And some of them even go to the extent of saying that there is no bona fide political system in Islam.
And so with regard to all matters such as this, if you claim to be a Muslim, you would refer this matter and all similar matters to Allah's words and the implementation thereof by His final messenger. Alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam. And so we will refer to a, to a couple of ayat from Surah Al-Ma'idah. And these are the third and the 67th ayat of the Surah. Allah Ta'ala says in the first of these ayat, الْيَوْمَ يَئِسَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِن دِينِكُمْ فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا And in the next ayah, being the 67th ayah in the same surah, Allah Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nabi, Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik, Wa illam taf'al ma ballagta risalatah, وَاللَّهُ يَعْصِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرِينَ And so the first ayah says On this day those who have rejected Allah's presence in the human affair have given up all hope that you would forsake your deen. And so do not hold them in awe, hold me in awe. And of course this is Allah talking. On this day, have I completed for you your deen? And have I perfected for you my favor upon you? And I have willed upon myself that self-surrender unto me shall be your deen. Now if we take a look at the first part of this ayah where Allah Ta'ala says الْيَوْمَ يَئِسَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِن دِينِكُمْ فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي There is a concession that Allah Ta'ala is making with regard to the mentality of the Muslims. that he identifies those who have rejected the power cultures that have rejected his power presence in the human affair that he identifies a certain tendency on the part of Muslims to take as a reference point what the people in power are doing and so that is why he says that do not hold them in awe, rather hold me in awe. And then he says, have I perfected for you your deen. For you cannot imagine that Allah has completed his deen for you until you reject those who are, are his rivals on earth.
Nonetheless, for those who read these ayat, Allah is telling us something about ourselves, our deficiencies, our tendencies. And so in an attempt to preempt this tendency of putting our reference point in whatever power culture happens to exist in our time and day, He gives us these ayat. And so He is telling us that insofar as the deen that He has communicated to us in the Qur'an and in the example of His Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, that everything therein is complete. There is nothing missing. There is nothing that requires embellishment. There is nothing that can be added to something that is already perfect, to something that is already completed. And yet we have a contingent amongst ourselves that continue to press the question. That in a matter as important as leadership, why didn't Allah Ta'ala reveal to us a mechanism that may be akin to something like democracy? And in the past, there were other mechanisms to choose leaders. And you would hear Muslims in the past holding those systems as reference points and asking themselves that why don't we have something that Allah has revealed to us that makes this transition a peaceful exercise. Sometimes brothers and sisters, we don't get to the wrong we, we don't get to the right answers because we are asking the wrong questions. The issue here when choosing a leader is not about what mechanism you employ to choose the leader. The issue here is about choosing the best person qualified to lead. The Qur'an makes the objective clear. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تُؤَدُّوا الْأَمَانَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ نَعِمَّا يَعِذُكُمْ بِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا Indeed, Allah commands you to render the trust of rule to its capable, exec to its capable executors. This is a command from Allah. But it is also part of Allah's mercy that He left it open to you in whatever time and place you live to construct a mechanism to be able to achieve that objective, but not to sacrifice that objective for a, trans for a transitory or a transitional mechanism. And so what is important here? It's not the method that you employ to choose a leader, but to keep in mind and to keep front and center the importance of choosing qualified people to make decisions on your behalf. In a sense, it's like you seeing a man drowning. And you see him drowning and then you entertain a discussion about whether to throw him a rope or to throw him a float. The important, per the important thing is to save the person from drowning, regardless of what method you use. And you can't lose sight of the fact that when you choose leaders, the important thing, the important strategic objective is to choose people who are qualified to lead. So let's round this out a little bit more.
And let's briefly talk about the model of democracy which is employed to choose the chief executive or to choose other representatives that represent the people. We have a mechanism that's employed and that was in full force in the past several months. And so keeping in mind what was just said, can it be said that wherever this particular system has taken root in our world today, that wherever it has taken root, this particular mechanism to choose our leaders, and that, of, that system, of course, is called democracy. Wherever in the world this system has been employed, can it be said that it allows the finest and the best people in society to ascend to a position of rule? And we have the backdrop of this election that just took place. Right here in what is considered to be the most power the most powerful city in the world. The power capital of the world. And a democratic election took place here. And can it be said that those candidates who were proposed for the people to choose from, that these people were the ones who were most qualified, that they were the most moral, that they had the most experience and that they had the most quality to become the leaders of 300 million people and thereby the leaders of the world. Now, of course, the answer to that question is no. But nonetheless, we have a society that is wed to this structure that regardless of the fact of whether or not it produces the best people to, to be in positions of rule, the society continues to want to employ the same structure, which is not solving their problems of producing the best people to make decisions on their behalf. And so does it make any sense for Muslims to ask for something that is not an answer to their problem. Why do we have powerful contingents in Muslim countries across the world, or, or majority Muslim countries across the world, who are demanding that we have a mechanism similar to this one to choose their leaders, or who are looking for some kind of a rationalization or a justification in the Quran and in the Sunnah? to employ such a structure in their own lands. Despite the fact that in the, in the birthplace of that structure, it is not solving problems for the people who conceived of that model. From the understanding of this speaker, a mechanism is constructed to solve a problem. And once that problem is solved, the mechanism is deconstructed or it is shelved. But nowhere in the world where you find people who are on their way to achieving a set of objectives, do you find them employing a mechanism that was dedicated to a different problem to solve a current problem? If you have to solve a problem, you develop a structure around the problem to solve it. But if that structure is not solving your problem, the thing to do is to destroy the structure, not the objective. The objective is to choose the people who are qualified to rule. 
qualified in terms of having taqwa, in terms of having knowledge, in terms of having patience, in terms of not resorting to weapons when a political engagement will do. The Qur'an is a book of objectives and principles. Allah Ta'ala has in His mercy and in His insight and His foresight has given us the flexibility to construct whatever structure or mechanism we need to solve a problem and to achieve an objective. We've been given the broad outlines of principle. But we find that because we place our reference points in the dominant power culture of the world, that we are using their structures to solve problems that do not address our needs. And so in a sense, what is being said here, if the mechanism fails you in achieving a particular objective, an objective that is defined by Allah and by His Messenger, then get rid of the mechanism and construct a mechanism that is appropriate to helping you solve your problems and achieve your objectives. And by the way, if we were to take that kind of an approach, perhaps we could set an example for others to not be wed to the kinds of things that set their forefathers back. For indeed, this particular mentality of doing what your predecessors did, even though those same things are not solving your problems today, this kind of mentality has been identified by Allah in His ayat. And, and again, I'm sure that we, we, all of us, are very familiar with these ayat. Inna wajadna aba'ana ala ummah wa inna ala atharihim muqtadun. That we found our forefathers on a particular directional course and we feel that in their footsteps there is guidance. And so this is the situation that we have today. Once again, brothers and sisters, the imperative that should not be lost because of a particular mechanism, regardless of how powerful and how pervasive that mechanism is. The objective here is to choose people in positions of rule who are qualified for that position. And if the mechanism that you're employing is not delivering those people, then the thing to do is to destroy the mechanism and construct something new that helps you achieve the objective of choosing the most qualified people to rule. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه يغفر لكم فاسترشدوه يرشدكم اللهم صل اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Our objective here is to try to better understand Allah's guidance and the way that Allah's final prophet 
helped us understand that guidance by putting it into motion. Our objective here is not to talk about the political processes in this city and in this country. The only reason that those processes and programs were mentioned was to provide a context, a real live, everyday context to help us understand more precisely and more accurately the guidance that Allah gives us in His book and in His faultless words. And that is the only reason that we bring up those events and those circumstances so that we can place ourselves within the environment of the Qur'an and the Sunnah so that we can better walk through a very troubled world. Now having mentioned the new administration that is about to take office in this city, based on the appointments that the president-elect is going to make to his new cabinet, there appears to be a struggle that is taking place between an ideological elite and a corporate elite. The corporate elite feels or regards the entire Muslim world to be a, to be a huge and a giant market that can better be approached through diplomacy and that the martial or the military approach is counterproductive. The ideological elite, on the other hand, prefers to deal with Muslims on the other side of a barrel of a gun. And the reason that we say this is because there are potential representatives or appointees in the administration of the president-elect who have this very view. In fact, one of them is represented by the potential secretary of the Department of Education. Many of us do not know this, and I'm not going to mention her name. You can go back home and look this up. She happens to be the sister of the founder of Blackwater. And all of us know about Blackwater. I don't have to go into any details about that organization and the person who founded that organization. But in the incoming administration, the sister of the founder of Blackwater is going to be setting policy for education. Now this ideological and corporate struggle that's taking place or that may take place in the, in the incoming administration, this back and forth between the corporate elite and the ideological elite, it has, it has found a convergence in the matter of Azerbaijan. Just two days ago, in the Trump International Hotel right here in Washington. There was a Hanukkah celebration commemorating religious freedom and diversity. And this Hanukkah celebration was sponsored by the Embassy of Azerbaijan just two days ago. It was sponsored by the Embassy of Azerbaijan and the Conference of Presidents of, of major Jewish organizations in the United States. Now this was kept a secret. 
the fact that this event was taking place, it wasn't advertised, the media was not invited. In fact, it was a, an, an invitation only get together. And it was, it was marked to take place one day after the visit of the Israeli Prime Minister to the capital of Azerbaijan in Baku. And this is the second visit of the Israeli Prime Minister. The first one took place about 20 years ago to that country. Now when the Israeli Prime Minister visited Baku on Tuesday, the President of Azerbaijan, and once again you can go and look up his name, the President of Azerbaijan said that in the previous few years, that country had purchased something on the order of a little less than $5 billion worth of weapons and security equipment from Israel. And then he went on to say that the relationship between Israel and Azerbaijan is like an iceberg because nine-tenths of it is below the surface. And so this, he could have been suggesting that this country has actually purchased over $50 billion worth of arms and security equipment from Israel. Not only providing their economy support, but also providing the U.S. economy support. But beyond that, the question that has to be asked is who is all of this, all of these arms, who are they going to be directed against? There are only 20,000 20, Jews in Azerbaijan, and yet there are 10 million Muslims who are in Azerbaijan, and they don't even have the right to choose their own leader. And so how is it that the embassy of this country in the United States is holding a Hanukkah party celebrating religious diversity? When we Muslims in that country don't even have the right or the license to choose our own leaders. Brothers and sisters, it is well known. This is an unspoken, yet popularly acknowledged reality in Washington. The dictators from all around the world, they nurture a relationship with Israel in order to curry favor with powerful and influential Jews in Washington and in the United States so that they in turn have a good word to say about these dictators to the American establishment. And one of the countries who became very good at doing this are the royals and the monarchy in Arabia. Not that we have to point to another example of their hypocrisy, but Azerbaijan is 95% Shiite. And for all the demonization that has taken place by this government and by this monarchy, against those who claim to be affiliates of the Prophet's family, why do they have a very cordial relationship with the government of a country who's holding a Hanukkah party in Washington commemorating religious diversity? And so once again, brothers, we ask you to focus on the meaning of these ayat. Al-yawma ya'isa al-ladheena kafaru min deenikum fala takhshawhum wakhshawni Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam deena Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa zuqna al-tiba'ah 
وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب دعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ حديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على إب اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في هسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر 